Thank you for playing the old classic <laughs> and shaking it up a bit. Thank you. Appreciate that. So my grandfather used to play something like this. And I remember asking at one point, what's the difference between a violin and a fiddle? My grandpa smiled and said, depends upon how it's played. I think we heard both of them there. <laughs> Good job, thank you, appreciate it very much. So I thought the children's story for, was gonna be about me, she said about uh, antique old man <laughs> who's lost power. <laughs> so long ago, I guess I got old, Long ago, and I think it was in third grade, might have been second, but I think it was in third grade, I was asked to do something for a program at my school. The teacher came to me and says, well, you know, Lyle, I, I, I know you're more quiet and you like to read a lot. I think if you could, I bet you could do a poem for the program. I said, a poem? I don't know how to write a poem. Oh, no, it's the one I already read. All you have to do is stand up and recite it. Oh, I get to read it? No, she says, I want you to memorize it and then stand up and say it. I don't know if I actually broke out in a sweat, but my mind did. Because as an extreme introvert, I was like, what? Memorize? Stand up in front? Oh, no, what am I going to do? So I was given about a month to memorize it, and I remember working on it really hard. Again and again, every night before I went to sleep, I would read it and try to memorize it in my head. After about a month, I had one line down. And I kind of knew some of the rest of it and words popped up. But here's what I do remember. The night of the program, I was there. My hands were shaky, sweating. I didn't even know what, why I was sweating because I wasn't running anywhere. And I stood up on the stage in front of a mic. And I looked at the mic and looked at all the people out there. You wanna guess what happened at that point? <laughs> Are you with me? No, not that any of you would ever have that problem, but I think I got half of the first line out, and that was it. And I remember just staring and going, wow, all those people. I was processing this in my brain, and here's what was happening in my brain. Wow, my parents are going to be very much ashamed of me. My teacher is going to be very disappointed in me. And all these people out here will know what a fraud I am. I couldn't put all those words together at that age, but that's the kind of thing, thinking that went through my mind. Finally, I'd had enough without saying anything, and I just walked off. And you know how parents do? <laughs> yeah, little, little uh, pity applause there, you know. And I tell you this story it's kind of a children's story, but it's very real. And I tell you that because it represents a big part of my life. For the next 20 years, there was something I couldn't do. What I'm doing here today, standing up in front of others. I was in a prison. Oh, I couldn't have said that back then. But I realized I was being incapacitated by what had happened to me and the thought that I might do it again and have the same results. Any of you ever had an experience like that? Today, my sermon, I entitled it Unprisoned. Unprisoned. Maybe that seems a little harsh, but the text I want to look at today is about being free from prison. I really appreciate Pastor Joseph's taking us through the master class with Jesus himself in Matthew and then teaching us about chiasm. Did I say that word right? Chiasm. You guys know how to say it now. He's done it so much. And how 
the chiasm points to this center section in Matthew 6 called Our Father Prayer. You heard it today up here, right? Our Father. And at the very heart of Our Father Prayer is what? Thank you. Somebody's been here with me. It's about what? Forgiveness. Forgiveness is at the very heart of the Lord's Prayer, which is at the very heart of the master class on how to be a follower of Jesus. So I'm tasked today with thinking about communion. And as I read through Matthew's account, not Matthew 5 and 6, but Matthew 26, at the very end of Jesus' life, in the upper room, we're going to look at a few verses there. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26 and 27. And then we'll go to 28 and 29, but 26 and 27. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. And the verse I really want to focus on is the next verse, 28. He said, this is my blood of the covenant. Covenant is a will, an arrangement, an agreement, which is poured out, spilled, shed for the forgiveness. And now I come to the first word I want to think about. Forgiveness. You see the Greek there, aphesis, aphesis. And the Greek means to release something, to set it free, to deliver it from where it hadn't been free before. Is that what you think of when you think of forgiveness? Often I think of forgiveness as this kind of magical word that we use. Well, we use it sometimes out of church, but we use it a lot in church. And some of you know me well enough to know that when you use a word long enough, it can start to lose its meaning. Forgiveness means to be set free, but you can only be set free if you're not free now. Are you with me? And so we come to the idea of being freed from prison. There should be a little picture that shows the idea of being freed from prison. I just found it on the internet. Released, set free, yes, I'm out of here. But let's think about what that prison looks like. So if we go back to verse 28 there, let's look at the second part of it. Uh, he says to you will be set free, forgiven. And then it says of sins. Harmadia. The target means you miss the target. You shot it wide, you shot it high. You missed it all completely. And eventually it came to mean that you made a mistake and you erred. You didn't hit what you were supposed to hit. And I want you to think about that prison for just a moment because I experienced that prison in a very real way when I was back there in third grade. But everybody's prison is a little different, but they have some commonality. What kind of prison have you experienced? What kind of prison do people around you experience? Well, you can be in prison that you need forgiveness for when you do something wrong to somebody else and now there's this trouble between you. You're fighting each other and this, this conflict produces in you anger or frustration. Often it produ produces anxiety. And did you know that anxiety actually brings real physical elements to it? You're in prison and you can't get out of it and then you start having multiple problems occur to you. There's other kind of prisons. Uh, it may be all yourself, you uh, kind of like me. Nobody said I did a bad job. 
They even had a pity clap. But nobody told me, Lyle, you messed up. Lyle, you're in prison. Where did that idea of prison come from me? My own head. My own head told me that people must think badly of me because of what I had done or not done. I'd missed the mark of, of what I was asked to do. And then we overlay it, in some cases, with this kind of theological set. I messed up with God. I sinned. By the way, armadia is often translated sin, but it means to miss the mark. I miss the mark with what God asked me to do, is what it's saying. And we all miss the mark in that respect. How do we deal with missing the mark? Eh, we do it in different ways. The shame often comes and incapacitates you. But some people can't stand the pain of the shame. So one way of dealing with missing the mark Harmadia, it's to start finding out, oh, it's not me, it's somebody else did this to me. And so we think, well, if it's not me, who else am I to blame? And in, in the world today, if you think about it, most of us find somebody else to blame for our problems. Oh, that person said it to me. That person was mean to me. That person was angry with me. That's their problem. It's not my problem, even though I'm the one putting that inside of myself and putting myself in jail, in prison. Or we think about God. Well, God doesn't like me. Boy, I don't like being with God. I'll just stay away from church. Uh, I, I won't pray. I won't think about those things. I hate God. He's, he's the one that put me in prison. No, we put ourselves there, but we actually want to blame somebody else. No, we do it in many other ways, too. Um, in our society... We like to blame politicians. No? you never done that? Oh, those people are so inept. That's why we're here where we are. Or blame somebody else that you don't even know, but you figure out a way to blame them anyway. Some conspiracy going on. I'll blame them. But all that blaming doesn't let me loose from my prison. Are you with me? So here's the problem we face, and I want you to think about what Jesus says. This cup is the blood of my new agreement, my new way of looking at life. I am freeing you from the prison that every one of you are in for whatever reason so that you can live in a world of thriving, live in a world of safety because God puts you in that place. Now, Pastor talked about how long does this take to happen, and he was pretty explicit with some of his illustrations about forgiveness, the freeing, the releasing. The problem I have is, if you're free, why can't I just be free today and go on? And today... The last verse that we're going to read helps us understand how God takes care of the prison problem. It starts right here today to begin with. Uh, sometimes I go to people that I've said bad things to. Sometimes I go, I go to God and say, God, take this away from me. I want to be free of this weight, this burden, this cage around me. And then I think, ah, it's all done. Wait, some of you are smiling. Wait, you're not done? Nope. Somehow, late at night, you're trying to go to sleep, and then you start thinking about it again. Maybe that just happens to me. But suddenly you're back to where you were. And then another day comes, and you try to free yourself, claiming the promises of God. I'm free. And then it comes back to you. Look at the last verse in our passage for today. I think I have it up there. Oh, there's. So, um, I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on 
until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The Lord's Supper, the special meal that we celebrate today, is ongoing. Now, what's really interesting to me is you and I come here and we celebrate this by drinking the cup, correct? But what is Jesus doing? He's not drinking. He's waiting. Why does he wait? He's telling us, I can't wait for the day until we do this together in God's kingdom. But that also tells me something else because he says his blood is the open door to forgiveness, to the release. And I start to think about that, and for me, it helped me understand that even in heaven, we'll continue the releasing process that we start right here now. So I could blame myself, I could blame somebody else for the fact that sometimes when I ask forgiveness, and then later on it comes back to haunt me, I'm still in my prison, and I say, God, I've missed the ark again. Now I'm in a new prison. I tried to get released, and I'm not there. But that last verse tells me it's okay, Lyle. It doesn't matter because you'll have ultimate release when you get to heaven. We'll continue working on it as long as you want. I had a friend who used to say, can you imagine heaven? Uh, Jesus, I've been working on this release business for a thousand years. A oh, thousand years is nothing. Wait till 10,000 years comes. You'll have it almost figured out by then. Does it really matter when eternity stretches out like this exactly how and when it happens? One day is as good as the next. And so I think about this. It's not only for forgiveness now, but the ultimate forgiveness that comes to us in heaven, which will truly be a safe place for all of us. Amen. So during my college years, my parents had this habit of moving from house to house to house. So I, I would actually, this is before, you remember the days before GPS? So here I am at college. Oh, mom, I'm coming home uh, this weekend. Where do we live now? <laughs> and, and then, well, she gave me an address, and I said, so how do I find it? And she says, well, you know how your dad always goes to AAA and has maps? That's why you have maps in your car. You figure it out. And that was the early GPS. It was on paper, okay? So when I got home, my mother was always there. And on Friday nights when I got home, my mother always made a special meal. In it, there would be some grapes, some slices of oranges and apples, and maybe uh, some of the frozen fruit that came during the summer, like berries. This is before people went to the store and brought frozen food. You made it yourself, and that was it. And my mother always had, my father called it fruit soup. Just put it all together, fruit soup and cornbread. Now I think back about that fruit soup and the cornbread, and I realize it wasn't just food that I was looking for. You know what I mean? It was the fact that there I was with my family who loved me and cared for me, and I was in a safe place. Not just safe place from physical violence or things like that. For me, it was a safe place for who I was becoming even if I still had questions, even if that my, my little prison still was confining me in certain places, I was safe with my mom and dad, even at college level. I wonder, do any of you have a safe place somewhere in your life that you can think about? Whatever that is, I don't know where your safe place, whether there was fruit soup or whether there was cornbread or something else, but sitting there at that table with my parents, even as a college student, I felt the idea of family. And so today we come to our father's house, 
with all of our siblings here, and we think about all of our siblings that aren't here, that we would like to be a part of the safe place where we are released from our prison, unprisoned, and where we no longer have to worry about when we miss the mark. I'm glad that opportunity exists for me into eternity. I want you to think about your safe place now and in the future as we celebrate communion today. God, Jesus, is welcoming us with the appetite for eternity at his table.